Amazing things in the lives of each person here. We pray that we receive your message, we take it to heart, and it changes our lives. We love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Be seated. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you're a guest here today, we are so glad that you are here this afternoon or this morning, I guess. Well, hey, we are walking through a series called My 359, and we're in the third week, and what we said in week one, we had a guest speaker, Dan Klein, came and killed it, and what he talked about was this premise of, for the longest time, it was deemed physically impossible to break the four-minute mile. Now, I don't know if you've ever run at all, but that's fast, okay? But they, they thought not only was it hard, they thought it was impossible. And then somebody had the audacity, the courage, the strength, the stamina to do it. And what is so incredible is what became after it. Not that he broke it, but after it, two weeks later, somebody else did it. And it became so common that 10 years later, high school kids from Kansas were breaking this four-minute mile that... What was once thought impossible now became normal. And what we said was that really what limits our life, what limits the trajectory, what God would do in us is is not necessarily God, not necessarily our imaginations or whatever. It's really our desires to pursue God that for every one of us, we should have a My 359. That every one of us here, you have things that you wish, that you hope God would do, save, resurrect, fix, overcome, build up. I don't know what they are, but every one of us, we have some things that we really wish God would deem just possible and intervene. That we view them as humanly impossible, and yet we believe, it's a whole series, that with God nothing is impossible. And that if we do some certain things, that God really wants to do something for us. And we talked about that last week, that really we said that in James, it says we lack not because God doesn't want us to have it, but because we don't ask for it. And so last week I challenged everybody. I said, hey, would you just spend 12 minutes every single day staying in position, praying for what God would do, for what you would want. And we never want to look back at the end of 2018 and go, man, I wonder what would happen if I'd have been consistent in my prayer life. I wonder what would happen if I would have consistently stayed in position every day praying. And so we cha- I challenge you every day for the year of 2018. That's a big challenge. I get it. But that we would be a people of prayer, that we would stay in position. And for 12 minutes every day, you would pray for your 359. And then at the end of the day, also, you would pray for our 359. That we would, at the end of 2018, see God do incredible, amazing things. Not for our glory, not because we did something great, but ultimately because we prayed and God showed up in an amazing, big, God-sized way. And we talked about that. Well, today, we're going we're gonna to hit the beginning of the story that we hit last week. Last week, we talked about a nation that was in a drought. And because Elijah prayed and prayed and prayed. It wasn't instantaneous. There was a process in it, but he prayed and he stayed in position. God brought rain. There was a cloud, and we talked about that. And if you missed it, you can check it out online. But if you were here with us, you know how this story ends, okay? So today, I want to go back in the beginning of the story, and I want you to see how it all started. Because here's what I'm going to say today. Prayer. Prayer is not enough. Now, if you grew up in church, that might seem heretical, okay? So don't leave, okay? We're, we're going to walk through that a little bit. But, but I really believe that prayer is not enough. It's foundational. It's incredibly important. It's our way that, that to talk with God. I believe that prayer fuels God's provisions, okay? So don't, don't walk out if you're like, Nick doesn't believe in prayer. No, that's why we started with it, actually. That's how important I think it is. But at the end of the day, Prayer is not enough. There's some other things I believe that we need to do in order to see God's blessings in our life, in order to receive that rain and get out of the droughts that we have. Because here's what I know about a room like this. There are droughts everywhere. Not, not physical droughts. No, it's snowed and we got plenty of wet on the ground. And you know, I don't know about you, but I had to wear different shoes. I've got wet shoes and dry shoes. Anybody got shoes like that? Nope, I'm the only, okay, great, that's awesome. Anyway, uh, so no, but I do. I mean, I I just literally, because I like my shoes, and so, you know, we have plenty of physical rain, but when I talk about droughts, what I know is we've got some really dry marriages. 
We've got some people in here that maybe you're even sitting next to the person, and yet you feel miles apart. We got some, some situations in here, and you got some dry finances. Like you're struggling, you're, you're working, and you're living paycheck to paycheck. And, and, and there are times where you are not sure how you're going to get past it. You got a credit card bill that is huge, and, and you're looking at it, and it's this big weight that's, that's just heavy, and it weighs, and you're not sure what you're going to do with it. But it weighs on you, and you feel it. There's some relational droughts here. You got a family member or a coworker, maybe a boss, I don't know, and you feel it. It feels dry. It was maybe once great. You once got along with that person. You once were so close. You once were best friends or, or whatever that is, and yet there's, some, there's a divide now. There's a desert now in between you, and it feels dry. For some people in here, it's your job. And you can remember the first day, and you were so excited to be at this new job. It's war on you. It's beat you down. You feel dry. I don't know what your desert is. It could be one of those things could be something completely di different. What I know is, I really believe if we stay in position that, that as we do some th certain things, that God, God is not a God of scarcity, but abundance. And he is not lacking in rain, but he's lacking in faithfulness of his people to follow him. So wherever you're at today, I wanna to unpack what I believe is one of the key secrets to success that we're gonna see in this story with Elijah as he starts to do this incredible God-sized miracle that brought the rain. So if you've got a Bible, I wanna encourage you to open up 1 Kings chapter 18. If not, we'll put it up on the screen for you. But here's what it says. It says when he, now he is Ahab, he's the king. He's the ruler. He's responsible. He is the man, King Ahab. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? This is so fascinating to me because here's what I know. And if you read the whole context, you see it, that the king who's ultimately responsible is blaming somebody else who's just in the vicinity. Elijah did nothing. Elijah didn't cause it to stop raining. That was God. Elijah didn't cause it to be dry. That was God. He's blaming somebody else. And as I look at this story, as I read it, I believe that today as we talk, there's going to be a series of steps. I believe the first step that you need to take is to take responsibility. Because what I know is the king is responsible for the spiritual and dire uh, relational direction of the nation. And there was some stuff in there that was messed up. And the king not only didn't deal with it, he encouraged it. He had a wife that brought in a whole bunch of other gods that we're going to talk about here in a second. And, and there was this struggle in the nation. And God, as you read it beforehand, God was frustrated with his nation because they started worshiping other gods. And he pulled back their ability to make money and fund what they were doing. Do you know, and I see this over and over and over again, God is not above and I think God does. God leverages consistently throughout Scripture. God will leverage temporary physical things in your world so that he can reach you and teach you about eternal impact you can have. He does that all the time. And he pulls out their financial means. He pulls out the rain, which represented their money, to get their attention. But even at this moment, Ahab, he doesn't own it. He's blaming somebody else. Let me ask you a question. Are you blaming somebody else for your problems today? Is there somebody in your world, maybe it's a spouse and, and you believe the lie that, you know what, I'd be happier if they were a better person. Maybe you believe the lie. Maybe you've said this in the past few weeks. They make me so angry. And what you're saying is, it's them, it's not me. I'm not gonna own this. They do it. If my kids were better behaved. <laughs> I said that one, okay. <laughs> Come on, let's, listen, let's be honest. If my boss was nicer, if, if, I was, if I was more appreciated, I'd work harder at work. If they would notice me, if they would do that, I'd just, listen, if, if, if I was more liked, I'd be friendlier, but no one likes me. I, I don't know. What, what, I, what I see in our culture right now is a lot of blame, and, and we blame our spouses and our kids and our bosses. We blame random things like the economy. 
People blame the president. People blame everything. Listen, and, and, and not that people can't affect your world. I'm not saying that at all. And they absolutely can do things that will mess you up and derail you sometimes. But what I know is there are a lot of droughts in this room right now. And the first step for you to overcome them, the first step for you to come out of them is for you to own the fact that, you know what, if I'm being honest, it's my fault. That, you know what, I contributed to this. I need to own my life. I need to own my destiny. In fact, there's a core value we have at our church, and it's we will be owners, not renters. That it's so important to us that we own our lives, that we own, our, that we own what we do and what we don't do, that that became a core value for us. But the story goes on. It says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you, don't miss this, you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. Now, you can pronounce Baal, Baal, or Baal. We're going to do Baals. But, you know, he said, Elijah looks right back at him. He just, like, claps right back. He says, no, 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 dude, I ain't owning that. That's your fault. You, you want to know why there's a drought in the world? Listen, don't blame God. Don't blame me. Don't blame your mama. Don't blame your wife. Don't blame your brother. Don't blame, no, don't. You walked away from God. You had a relationship with God. God blessed you. You as a nation. You all walked away from God, and this is God's predictable, natural response for when his people walk away from him. Do you know that when you walk away from God, there's a very predictable and natural response that God has every single time for the most part? Not immediate. See, see the, the great and frustrating thing is this. When, when you follow God, there's normally not immediate positive results. You ever been there? Like you pray, and you prayed for a day, and you're like, okay microwave it, God, come on, like it's, there's not immediate results. And, and that can be frustrating sometimes but, and, and can mess us up, but the opposite's true too, that when you walk away from God, there's also not immediate negative results, that you can stray from God for a while, for a week, a month, maybe even a year before the issues start to catch up with you. And, and for the Israel of the nation of Israel, they walked away from God for a while, and now all of a sudden it's catching up with them, and they've been gone so long that they're confused about who really is at fault. That's where some of you are here today. You've, you've walked so far from God that you're not quite sure what your next step is. And I'll tell you, your first step is this, to own it and take responsibility. Story goes on. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. So, so Ahab is challenged. He says, it's your fault. Elijah says, no, it's your fault. And they're like, okay, it's throwdown time, okay? It's Taylor Swift versus Katy Perry. They're throwing down. It's gonna be a duel, you know? Not really, but anyway, you know. It's, they're, they're, having a, they're having a battle, all right? And they're gonna see who got, who's real, all right? That, that's the whole deal. So Ahab's like, bring everybody. We're gonna, we're gonna assemble the nations and they're gonna witness who's really God. It goes on, this is great. Elijah went before the people and said, this is like, man, it's crazy. How long, this is not a motivational speech right here. How long will you, and here's the key word, waver between two opinions? I love that word. When I read it, that word jumped out to me. Because here's what I think our, here's what I think they were doing. They were worshiping Yahweh on one day and then Baal on a different day. They, they, were, they were going on one day, yeah, yeah, God's great. Okay, we love God. This is awesome. And yet and the next day, yep, yeah, so is Baal. They, they were saying, uh, you know, God's awesome on this other stuff. And he, he's the God of the desert and he's the provider and he can, he's the healer. But, you know, Baal. If you study the, the context of it, he's the God of money. He's the God of prosperity, the fertility. And they, they were worshiping this over here. And they saw no disconnect between the two. There was no tension. There was no disconnect. And as I saw that and I read that and I said, I thought, you know what? As a nation, we're the same way. See, there's two primary gods as you read scriptures that, that they primarily come up against. It's the God of Baal. It's the God of money. It's the God of Asherah. It's the God of sex. And, and, and what, what is happening here is Elijah looks at them and says, you're, you're wavering. You've got a lot of movement. You're, you're going over here to God, and then you're running over here to, to money. And then you're running back over here to God on Sunday morning, and then you're running back over here and sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend on Tuesday morning. You're running over here to small group on Tuesday night, and you're like, yay, God, and you're feeling filled over here. And then you're, you're, you're cussing somebody out on the road and using your words negatively. You're, you're sending out with your lips a prayer request, and you're kind of doing all this over here, and you're worshiping this God because he's the God of the healer and the whole deal. And then you're running back over here, and you're bad-mouthing a coworker with the same lips and the same voice. 
And Elijah says, listen, you're wavering. And you got a lot of movement. You're going back and forth. you got a lot of movement. There's no momentum. Let me ask it this way. Today, if you're being honest, do you feel God's wind at your back? I know you're busy. I know you're doing a lot of stuff. You may even be doing a lot of, a lot of religious stuff, maybe reading your Bible and studying and praying and coming to church and, and serving and giving, but you got over here, there's a disconnect because you got the God of money or you got the God of sex over here and you're worshiping, 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 worshiping. I just says, quit wavering. He, he goes on to, to, to say it even more clearly. I love this. This is, this is so fascinating to me. He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. Simple. If he's God, follow him. But if Baal's God, follow him. Listen, he's like, I, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to debate with you. The people said nothing. He says, listen, here's the deal. If God's real, follow him, but follow him. And if Baal's real, follow him. But if God's not real, walk away and move on. But the problem is, in the Christian world, especially in the church today, in my own life, and probably in yours in some areas, is we, we, we say on Sundays we follow God, and yeah, I love God, and that's great. We've got some disconnects, and we worship different gods. As I was studying it this week, what hit me was that as you look at the story, the issue isn't whether the nation of Israel believed God was real. I think churches talk all the time. You've got to believe God's real. You've got to put your faith in Jesus. You've got you to put your trust in Jesus. That's a great step. That's not everything, though. The nation of Israel believed in Yahweh, the God of the desert, the God of fire, the God of the shepherds. But if you read the stories, at some point they walked into this promised land. And they walked into a different context, into a different season of their life. And this was not the God of the shepherds because there's farmland. And this was not the God of the desert because there's plenty and there's water and there's crops. And, and these people here worship this other God, Baal, who's the God of prosperity. And so the nation did not struggle with whether God was real or not. The nation struggled with whether God was enough or not. And, and, and they struggled. You read the stories, and it's the God of Baal, it's the God of money, it's the God of sex. And over and over and over again, it's a struggle. And it's so easy to look at them and go, what a bunch of backwater people. How do they not get in? If I saw the fire, pillar by fire, if I saw that, you know, no way I'd struggle with that. We struggle with it all today. Thousands of years later, their story is our story. Go home today and pick whatever news outlet you like. MSNBC, Fox News, Huffington Post, CNN, I don't care what it is. Pick it. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't, doesn't matter the slant. Look at what they're talking about. They will talk about two primary things. Money, sex. It's still the same struggle. Government shut down. Why? Money. Where should it go? What should we do? Stock market's up. You should invest here. Here's where to put your money. Don't go into debt or you should buy this. Here's some ads over here. Money, 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 money. Half the articles will be about money. The other half? Sex. Homosexuality. Transgender. Me too argument. We have the whole thing with me too right now and this kind of trajectory. And, and, and I, listen, I'm not for sexual harassment anyway at all, but there's such confusion around it. There's such discussion around it. Why? Because it consumes us and we sacrifice each other, we sacrifice our relationships, we sacrifice our health. Why? Sex. We, we, have, we look at more porn than anybody else in the world, and we're consumed by it, and we sacrifice it. We sacrifice the health of so many things at that altar. Why? Same issues. We are no different. It's the struggle. Elijah writes it. He says, here's the deal. God's really God walk away. If he's not, don't go to church. Don't give him any money. Don't go there. Don't mess with it. If he's not God, don't follow him. But if he's God, put everything under his. If he's God, give him everything. The two primary gods that you will struggle with is your sexuality and your relationship to other people, flirting, lust, mind things, your sexuality, and your money, what you do with it. And let me be very, very clear. This is not a money sermon that I want your money and give money. No, this is a sermon about worship. What do you worship? Because what we worship, we will give to. What we worship, we will sacrifice to. And there's so many Christians, they've got dry areas of their life. 
They've got droughts. There's some people in here right now that you're a high schooler and you've got some relational droughts. And you can't seem to find the right guy. You can't seem to find the right girl. But you, you consistently do it your way and you won't give it over to God. Why? Because, listen, you believe in God. you got some movement over here and you're going back and forth. And you come here and I praise God and God's got everything and God can bring him. But I'm going to go to the bar over here and I'm going to look for him. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the, the captain of the team, and, and I know he goes too far, and I know there's some relational issues, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice my, my, my morals. I'm going to sacrifice my character. Why? Because I want to feel happy. I want to feel loved. Some men and women in here, you're way too close to somebody in your coworker, as a coworker. You're way too close to some people. You're flirting online on Facebook. And it's not that you don't believe in God. It's that you struggle with the very same thing that they struggle with. And you, there's a desert, which is why you're over here in the beginning. There's a desert in your marriage. You feel left out. Your spouse doesn't love you as much. Your spouse is kind of neglected you. There's something happened. Listen, let me just tell you right now. This area over here, you will never find peace and happiness doing it anything other than God's. This area over here, you will drink from this area. And you will be satisfied momentarily, but it will leave you Dry, thirsty. That is every one of our struggles on some level in some situation. Every time. Elijah said, choose one. See, the second step that you need to do after you start to own your own life is you need to make a decision who really is God. You need to decide to say, if God's really God, put it all under his authority. If he's not, then walk away. But if he, if he is, if you'd say, yeah, I believe God, listen, walk away. Quit having a lot of movement very little momentum. Well, after this, they, they cut up the bull and they, they do this whole test where they're gonna put two bulls on two altars and Elijah says, listen, let's just pray to both of our gods, the God that has fire rain down and consume the whole thing, that's the real God. And he says, just so, just so we're clear, just so it's fair, in okay, case so there's a random firestorm coming down, you know, you go first. So it says they cut them up, put them on the altar, did that whole thing, and then it goes on, it says this, Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of evening sacrifice. They have been going crazy all day. Doing all, they cut themselves. They do a whole bunch of different stuff. They're screaming. They just, it's crazy what they're doing. They're going all day. Why? Because their God is at stake. It's the ultimate test. The nation is watching. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Because at the end of the day, the gods that we worship, these, what we will call today, functional saviors, they do not speak. They do not talk. We worship them. We sacrifice to them. We have movement towards them. But they don't speak. Because at the end of the day, they're false gods. And it's false worship. And that's what they're coming to. They're realizing, you know what? Elijah makes fun of him and says, hey, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's asleep. Yell louder. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he doesn't like you. I don't know. You're never going to answer. So, there's some people in here right now I really believe, and I've had seasons of my life, where I was searching and seeking a false God, searching for answers. It was incapable of giving. And there's some people in here when it comes to money or relationships that you're searching for somebody else to fill you and speak to you and give you validation and give you hope and give you peace and give you happiness and they will never speak the right words. Only this God can do that. Story goes on. Elijah, though, took 12 stones, one for each of his tribes, descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. And as I read this, what jumped out to me was that word 12. And there's a reason that we asked you to pray for 12 minutes. There's a reason that we're going to ask you to do some other stuff with the number 12. Because it's as I was studying this, what jumped out to me was it says that the altar was broken down. And in that moment, I believe the altar represented the relationship. That just as the relationship between Israel and their God was broken, so was the altar. But how he fixed it is incredibly important. Because I don't know about you, but when I walk away from God, I feel like I've got to do some special kind of nod to God to get back into good graces with him, right? Like, I, I hear people saying, I, I've done this too. When I walk away from God, or maybe, maybe you're here today and you're not with God. You wouldn't believe, but you're kind of checking it out. And, and they'll say things like, Nick, I've got to clean up my life. 
I gotta do something special. I gotta, I gotta become special. I gotta fix some stuff. I gotta do some big grand gesture to God. Why? Because I have guilt and I've gotta do this big special thing. What I love about this is Elijah he just picks up 12 stones. 12, and, and again, they weren't boulders, they weren't special, they weren't significant, they weren't huge. Just 12 stones. And he put them together, and that became the altar. See, what I want you to see this morning is this. Your sacrifice doesn't have to be special to have significance. This is why 12 minutes is all you need. Some people sit back and they may push back and go, oh, you only prayed for 12 minutes? Shouldn't it be 30? Shouldn't it be an hour? Shouldn't we just like worship all? Like, no, 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 no. Your sacrifice, whatever it is, doesn't have to be special to have significance. Some of you feel inadequate because you can't give as much as you want. That's okay. Because it doesn't have to be special to have significance. God is not looking for people full of finances. He's looking for people full of faith. And too often, we want to measure up our efforts into the situation, our efforts into the relationship, what we put into the altar. And God's not looking for that. Some of you, you, you refuse to come to God because you believe the myth that you've got to be special or feel special or do something special to have any significant thing to offer to God. But that is so false. I love this. Elijah just walks around. It's like, okay, I'll grab this one. I'll grab this one. I'm just going to put it here. It's just 12 stones. It doesn't have to be special to have significance. See, see the third step is you've got to give a sacrifice, though. The story goes on. This is so crazy. He arranged the wood, cut the bowls into pieces, and laid it out in the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it onto the offering of the wood. Let me ask you really quickly. What do you not have a lot of in a drought? Water. How insane, insensitive, ridiculous is it for Elijah to be like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, grab all the water and dump it. Oh, we still got more? Dump it. Four times. It's like, dump it. Take the water. Dump it. Take the water. Dump it. Take the water. Dump it. Why? It's not, it's not like, this had zero to do with the miracle and everything to do with the sacrifice. Because it's not like if a fireball came and consumed the, the, the altar, they'd have been like, I, you know what, though? It might have been warm. I just, you know, it wasn't super wet. Like, you know, no. No, no, no. Don't miss this. This is the key to the miracle. That, that, he sacrifices what was lacking because God is not a God who is lacking. He's not a God of scarcity. He's a God of abundance. And what you're lacking, the drought that you have, he is not up there going, oh, I wish I could give you some, but I, mm, I, don't, have, I don't have any more relationships. Oh, you, you, have, you don't have any friends? Okay, I don't have any more friends up here. Oh, you don't, have, you don't feel loved enough? I don't have any more love up here. Or you don't have enough finances? Oh, I just wish I could help you with that. Like, I'm, I'm the God over here of the desert. I'm the God of shepherds, but I'm not the God of prosperity. I wish I could help you. Like, that's, that's not that God. And Elijah knows that. And Elijah starts this miracle, and he's like, boom, just dump it and dump it and dump it. And it seems ridiculous. It seems messed up. It doesn't make any sense. And there's some stuff that God will ask you to sacrifice that your spouse, maybe, that the world will look at you and go, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up. It seems insane. At the end of the day, if God's real, choose. Follow. He's not lucky. And the story goes on. That time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward. And prayed. See, your, your, your last step is you've got to step through. I told you, prayer's not enough. You've got to step. I'm all for prayer. But there's some steps you need to take. You've got to own. You've got to own your stuff. You've got to own. you got to take responsibility for what you've got. Okay? You, you've got to do that. And then you've got to choose. Which, who's God? You've got to make that decision. Nobody else can make it for you. You can pretend. You can fool everybody else. You've got to choose this. I believe in this God. And in doing so, walk away. Quit having so much movement. Start to create some momentum in a direction. Start to really have that wind at your back, that spiritual momentum. You can have it. It's right there. The problem is you keep looking into the wind. And you keep being frustrated. It's yours. It's right there. And Elijah, then, the next step is... We're going to offer the sacrifice. That was the step. The sacrifice. Here's what it says. Then, meaning after the sacrifice, after the ownership, after the decision, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. The wood, the 
stones and the stole and also, and I love the imagery, licked up the water. Gone. And it seems in that moment like a waste. Because you read the story and the rains don't come. You read the story and there's still some more work to do. You read the story and it, right now we're at this moment where we picked up last week where Elijah had to go then and continue to pray. That's why we started with prayer because it's foundational and stay in position to be asked seven times, is, it, is there rain, is there rain, is there rain, is there rain? And he finally says, there is a fire. Their sacrifice led to God's surplus. Your sacrifice is the key to lead to God's surplus. And it's not immediate. It's not a microwave. It's not a vending machine where you go, okay, here's my quarter, God. I want a candy bar. Like, that's not how it works. No. For some of you, the drought, drought lasted three and a half years. This is not a quick fix. This is a trajectory. This is a next step. This is your decision that you can make and to step into your destiny. And today, my hope, my prayer is that you would choose. You would choose Yahweh, the God, not just the God of the desert, not just the God of the healer, but the God of money, the God of prosperity, the God of fertility, the God of the relationships, the God of sex, the God of everything. He is Yahweh, omnipotent in every way at all. He is God, the end. And that you would start to take those steps. You would start to move into who God called you to be. You will start to become, become the man God called you to be. So this, this year, we're dreaming big in this series. I'm asking you to pray every day for 12 minutes. The second thing I want to ask you to do is take 12 steps over the next year. One a month, maybe. Which, again, I told a friend of that, a friend of mine that, I said 12 steps. He's like, Nick, shouldn't you take more? Shouldn't you be taking steps every day? That, listen, maybe. That's cool. What I know is this. We, we sometimes want to make what we do special. And at the end of the day, I just believe that many times it's the simple that lead to the significant. And so I'm asking you over the next year, maybe one a month, I don't know what it is, if you would start to step towards your destiny, if you would start to step towards your destiny, if you would start to, in process, step towards the real God, and in doing so, walk away from your fault. This looks different for everybody, but I know today you've got a next step. For some of you, you've got to walk away from an addiction. And as you leave today, you've got to throw away maybe a bad habit you've got in your pocket right now. Or you've got to unsubscribe to something. Or, or maybe you've got to block somebody, you've got a relationship, and you know it's not, it's not healthy. Or maybe you've got to break up with somebody, you've got a relationship that's bad, you've got to walk away from that. You've got to walk away. You've got to walk away and walk into. Because God doesn't want to do just something for you. He wants to do something in you. And he wants to show you, like he showed the nation of Israel, I'm the God of everything. I'm not just the God of your salvation. I'm the God of your money. I'm the God of your relationships. I'm the God of your job. I'm the God of your prosperity. I'm the God of fertility. I'm the God. I'm the God. The end. God. Lord. Everything. Period. And so today, take that step. Would you stand with me? I want to end with this. We're going to sing There is a Cloud. Because I believe there is a cloud. I believe it might be the small of a person's hand, but I believe it's coming. It's coming for our church. I believe that as you take your steps individually, it allows us to grow spiritually together because it says that we're a body. And when one part hurts, the whole body hurts. When one part is blessed, the whole body is blessed. So as you grow, it's why it's our vision, why it doesn't have anything directly to do with us, it has everything to do with you. Because I believe as God works in you, as you follow God, as you make Him work, everything else will fall into place. And we, we will have the imprint of the church that we want. We're going to sing there as a cloud. I want you to stay and sing with us. But for some of you, I want you to take a step. I want you to take a step forward here today. I want you to be bold and courageous. I want you to become the man or the woman that God's called you to be. And I want you to do what Elijah said, which is take a step. To step forward and pray. To come forward and pray. And leave your junk here. Leave your stuff here. Get clarity on a next step. Maybe it's a positive thing. It doesn't always have to be negative. But some of you, you've got some next steps. And you've got some stuff you want to overcome. And you just need that extra. Step and pray. For some of you, you need to give your life to Christ. You've never done that. 
and there's some issues and there's some tensions and you kind of like half one foot in, half one foot out, today is your day. Today is the day that you need to step forward and declare, I choose God. I'm no longer going to choose sex. I'm no longer going to choose money. I'm no longer going to choose that addiction. I'm no longer going to go there. No longer, I, I choose God. God, bring the rain. So wherever you're at, whatever you're walking through, whatever your next step is, I believe for many of us in here right now, that step is towards this altar. Don't lie to yourself and say you can do it in the ch- seats. Because you know what that is? That's the God of ego. And I've seen more people, I've talked to more people, some of you in this place right now, who have told me, I felt like I should come forward, Nick. I was worried about what people think. Quit sacrificing your destiny and your future because you're worried about your ego. Kill it. Move past it. Step into it. Let today be the day that you wholeheartedly, unabashedly, full force with everything you got pursue your heavenly Father. Let's sing and let's come forward. Beginning to swell To the skies Heavy with blessing Lift your eyes Offer your heart Jesus Christ Open the heavens Now we receive The Spirit of God.